We're going to call this seated in Christ. Seated in Christ. That's the subtitle of reigning in life through Christ. Seated in Christ. Now, many, many people are in Christ, but they're not sitting down resting. <laughs> they're still being agitated and frustrated. So we're going to talk about what it really means to be seated. It's talking about authority, confidence, focus. All these things is what seated means. When you come down into a, sea, a, a theater and you have the guys coming down the ushers and he says, please be seated. And the Bible says for us to be still and know that he's God. The word know there in the Hebrew as an interest to know him intimately, how his Godship is to know him as God. Say amen. All right, so if we get our, our uh, scriptures up, and I'm going to take a sip. I like to sing a lot. I try not to sing because I sing loud. And if you're ever sitting by me, and when I hit a wrong note, I hope it doesn't inspire you the wrong way. All right, so here's our scriptures. There's going to be three of them. Galatians, first one is chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. This is Paul speaking. He was a Jew. Now he's become a Christian. He identifies, yes, if he could give his heart, his eyes, he would pluck them out, that Jews would be saved. But now he's become a Christian. And he says, I am crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who lives. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh or in the natural, I live by faith. In the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're alive in Christ where we act through Christ. Can you say amen? But when we act of ourself for Christ, we can get into trouble. And that's where we get out of the tank. Second Corinthians 5, 17, we know what it says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The Greek says a new species of being, and it puts this little emphasis that has never existed on the planet before. In other words, we're not restored to where Adam was. We're something greater than Adam. Because, yes, God created Adam, but you and I have God in us. We're walking around in the tank, and God is walking around in us. I used to always say in my Sunday school classes, that means behave yourself. <laughs> Amen. All right, laugh with me a little bit. Let's go to our third scripture. It's also in Galatians. I say then, Paul speaking again, in, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill your flesh lusting. In other words, your flesh has desires, wants, needs. Those things need to be stilled when I am crucified with Christ. Amen. And they're still in your flesh. If you, if you don't keep that flesh subject to God, a lot of people say, well, you say for us to go ahead and go to God every morning and ask God to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that right? I says, yeah. Why? It resets you. It doesn't get rid of everything else. Doesn't make you a sinner. Doesn't make you a sin during the night. No. That's a crazy thinking. No, it resets you. God wants you reset every day. Why? Because he wants to walk with you every day. He wants you walking with him every day. And he can't reset us if our mind's on other things. Just a little presentation. Can you say amen? Then once we're reset, it's easier to follow our shepherd by the spirit of the living God. This I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the desiring of the flesh. For the flesh desires against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one another so that you do not, listen, 
You can't do, you do not do the things that you wish. In other words, it turns us into a double-minded person. And you know what the Bible says about that in James. But if you are led by the Spirit, now listen, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now everybody says, well, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. That's not the law he's talking about. He's talking about a little law mentioned in Romans 8, verse 2. The law of sin and the law of death. What do you mean? That's in the planet. It's called the mystery of iniquity. It's already working in the planet. It's working on everyone that walks in the natural. That's why we age. But you and I got to take it out of here. Can you say amen? We walk with God. So we are shielded. And we're going to get to that in a minute. We're shielded from that. Yet our body still ages. So wouldn't you like to have it age with grace? Come on. Wouldn't you like to age with grace? Not age in some hospital or someone taking care of you? Well, yes, we would. Well, nobody knows. The out See, there you go thinking in the natural again. God holds our future. Go to him for your tomorrow. And let him pull out the fruit of that day. Don't look at tomorrow with the eyes of a natural man. You might get blurred. <laughs> Moving right along. Are you with me? All right. So if we are led by the spirit, you're not under the law of sin and death. Say, I'm not under sin. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. You've been transformed now into a child of God. That's who you are. Well, the super humble, you know, the ones that are over humble. Oh, Lord, I'm unworthy. Oh, well, sure we are. But you don't want to tell the father who just adopted you through Jesus Christ, who just loved you. He sent his son to hell and back that you're unworthy. How crazy is that? If we were unworthy, he would have never sent his son for us. Now, let's get off ourselves. And get up, look up, be up, stir yourself up, say amen. All right, let's get into our lesson, all right? Amen. Blessings to you, ch the church families and friends, people watching later on in life. Today we're going to see that God has set us in the body just as it pleases him. Amen? We have been saved filled, placed in heavenly places in Christ. If we choose to walk with Jesus, see, it's a choice. You have to choose to walk with him because a lot of Christians love God. They go to church, but they're not walking on a daily basis with God. They're not including God within them. Well, God's bigger than all that. No, he's not. He wants to be personal. Don't forget that. You're his buddy. Don't call him buddy, but you're his child. Say amen. But we have to choose to walk with Jesus. So as we do, we grow up in him spiritually. And we can live and walk in that realm of the kingdom in the spirit of God. Do you agree with that? So as a child of God, living in the full benefits of God, they're ours. Satan can't keep you from what's yours in God if you choose to walk with the Lord. Now, the key is we step in and out with that kind of fellowship with God until we learn to be stable. Hello. We have to learn to stabilize, to really face ourselves and evaluate ourselves so we come to a place of where God's at, that we are really at a rest with God and confident that when we get up the next day, we have the victory. We're not looking for victories. We're living victory. You see? Who's our victory? So we're living through him. So if you get the mindset, oh, yeah, things are tough, blah, 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 and then you go and make a mistake and talk about it, last week's lesson, becomes a stronghold. No, no. Don't talk about what the devil does. 
Hello? Plenty out there to look at, but don't, I'm not encouraging you to. Last time I went out to the mall, it was like going to the zoo. I wanted to buy popcorn and peanuts. Now, you can come to me later on and, and you can ask me what I mean by that, but it just looked like a circus out there. I mean, these are real people that are like sheep without a, without a pastor, without a shepherd. They need to see God in us, and we need to live that example so that they know we're solid. Can you say amen? And the one that we're solid in is Christ, unmoved, unshaken. Believers, we must understand that we are to reign in life, not to be slaves to life. And we reign in life through Jesus Christ, having all authority. Why? Because Jesus said he had all authority. If Jesus Christ said he has all authority in heaven and in earth, how much is that? All. And where are we? We're in Jesus. We're in the tank. So guess what? When we're in the spirit, we're under the full authority and power of God. Not by anything that we have done, but according to our faith and belief into what God's word describes for us. And forget not all his benefits. Wow. Don't forget them. They're yours. Oh, honey, I forgot to lock the car. And you know the neighborhood we live in. Yeah, I'm just, you know. We're going to cover these four areas. Are you ready? Hopefully we'll, be, we'll do it with real, a full look at them. Number one, we are positioned in Christ. Never forget that. You get up in the morning, present yourself to God, you're in Christ. That means the devil just lost sight of you. You've been cloaked. Father, I present myself to you in Jesus' name. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now you're cloaked. The only thing the enemy's watching for is your routine. And that's okay. Keep the routine in the spirit. Can you say amen? Two, we grow in his presence spiritually. So abide there. We need to abide there. You work it out with God. You'll figure it out how you can do it with your busy schedule. Thirdly, we are hidden and shielded in Christ in God. Never lose sight of that. Never lose sight of that. Because you might hear the enemy say one day, I can see you. But he's yelling from way down the street and he can't see it all. Because he's a liar. I knew a long time ago, man, a busy person, two children, full-time ministry, working at Boeing, and God, I was just complaining up, and, and God says, you've got all this power carry at your disposal. I says, well, where is it? He says, you got to use it. You got to put the word to practice, believe what you say when you ask, and you got to enjoy who you are. You're my kid. Do you think God wants his kids that happy? No, and Satan knows how to get to our father. Irritate his kids. So you stay under the shadow of the Almighty. Can you say amen? And I will say of my God, he is my shield and my refuge, my fortress. In him will I trust. All right. Fourthly, did I get three? Yeah, we're hidden, shielded. And fourthly, learn your, how to dwell in the command center. We're going to talk about the command center of prayer. All right, so let's get going on this. Number one, we are positioned in Christ. When the term in the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You are a new creation. Well, we often bring the understanding of who we are from our past. You cannot do that. You have to go to the Bible and let God unravel and reveal to us what we are, who we are in Christ. 
and then allow him to teach us how to walk with God. Can you say amen? That does take a little time. But you're learning, all of you are learning well. Remember, it's according to what you do and practice, not just what you say. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. We are positioned in Christ. Look what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed, past tense, with every spiritual blessing. Say, I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Look at your neighbor. Say, I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. So how do we get our hands on? You have to get in the spirit. And you have to ask God to keep you, ask you and teach you, excuse me, ask God to teach you how to stay in the spirit. And you can. See, I was taught in Bible college that you only get in the spirit when the anointing's on you. And then you just come out and all that. That's because their understanding of it. Listen, God made a place where you and I can dwell, where we could have a little steak on the plate while we wait and not wait for the pie in the sky and the by and by. Hello. And that place is with Jesus. That place is sitting and listening. Can you imagine the turmoil that was going on during Jesus' time? Rome once and hated the Jews. Pontius Pilate and all the Herod and all those gang. They were really under great persecution. And yet Jesus walked through the midst of them with sort of representing the kingdom of God. And everybody that joined him got blessed, got healed. I'm not everybody to the exact person, but anybody that hung around Jesus were affected. They were fed. They were healed. They were pampered. They were never without a thing. Kind of like Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, I'm not talking about a pipe dream here. I'm talking about this is a place where God has for every believer, every child of God. And it has to be taught in order to be believed for. You won't be able to believe for things if you don't know they exist. Hello, isn't that right? You might one day be in Africa. Maybe you're an African. You've never seen a car in your life. Then somebody drives by with a car. And you go, what's that? Now all of a sudden you're looking for it. God wants to open up the kingdom of heaven and show us things and take us on a walk into those things. He said a guided tour in 2 Peter 1. That the spirit wants to walk us through into the kingdom of the everlasting father. In order to do that, we have to be in the spirit for that to happen. How many times did you hear the scripture say, and I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was caught away in the spirit. The Spirit got a hold of me and moved me this way. You follow? That's who you are. We got a great example of how to follow Jesus in the walks of Elijah and Elisha. How they followed each other. Read the events. That's how we should follow Jesus. That when he was taken up and threw down his mantle, we picked it up and we struck the water. Say amen. amen. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the higher realm, in the heavenly places, right? But look what this says, Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards those in Christ Jesus. That's what he's doing with us right now. Can you say amen? One of my first points is we are born again believers, have full access spiritually to everything God's provided. We we'll only have to come through Jesus and in the spirit. That locks Satan out. Remember, Satan can't go into the spirit. You can you go through Jesus, you stay in the spirit, you learn to dwell in the tank, can you say amen, or in Jesus. 
I like to use the tank illustration. It sort of gives you a kind of a broad, powerful look. Jesus is an undefeated tank, creator of all things. He's never been defeated. He's never been challenged. The devil tried that. He lost three temptations as we read them. Amen. You know something about Jesus? He sealed up everything. I'm going to, can I go on a little side journey here? I love to study. Now there's, I can point you out to this. There is a mountain called Mount Hermon in Israel. And that's the place where the fallen angels came down and made the pact in Genesis 6 where they, they would take women for their wives and produce an offspring or a hybrid. Don't want to go too far. But are you aware that when Jesus came into Philippi and Caesarea, that was right at the base of that mountain? And what was the conversation? Jesus said, who do men and people around you say that I am? And of course, we know finally Peter stands up and he says, you are the Christ, the living God. And he said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. But my father, which is in heaven, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, the place where they stood was right before what they called, because of the fallen angels, the gates of hell. So not only did Jesus seal up the gate of hell there, where the Nephilim came, where the, where the fallen angels came and produced the Nephilim offsprings, he sealed it up. He also took, you still with me? Are you learning? He took Peter, James, and John up into the mountain. What mountain do you think that was? Mount Hermon, where the angels came, the fallen angels came down, polluted the, the world. He took Peter, James, and John up into the mountain. And what happened? He was transfigured before them. And boy, Peter got, wow, man, let's build three tabernacles. Religion. Everybody wants to be religious. And Jesus was talking with, it says, Elijah and, and Moses. Now, Elijah represents the prophets and Moses the law. And the Jews were hung up on the prophets and the law. But something new was happening. Jesus did seal up the gates of hell right there below, took Peter, James, and John up, and then right in front of them, he's transfigured. A cloud comes down, and Peter says, it's good for us to be there. Let's make three tabernacles. Let's be religious and build a big church. Hello, it's okay. And all of a sudden, the cloud came, and all of a sudden, it dissipated, and there was Jesus there. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And when on the cloud ceased, there was only Jesus. And the scripture puts it out really important that we are to focus on Jesus, not the law, not the prophets. Focus on Jesus. If you don't believe me, read Hebrews chapter 1. It says, on the son he saith. And so our focus is Jesus Christ. And that's why Pastor Linda and I ask you to really focus in. Get your eyes off everything else. Why God's walking you through the valley of the shadow of death. And you don't have to fear no evil for God is in you. Say amen. So that's who you are. You're positioned in the tank in Christ. Can you say amen? Secondly, we have elevated. We've been elevated in Christ. You're not sitting just on this planet. You're elevated in Christ. Hello. And thirdly, now we are to display the power by presenting ourselves to the Lord and allowing his power to be able to pass through us. See, when you lay hands on the sick, it isn't your hand. God passing through your hand. Learn to release God. I used to teach our classes, put your hand on your tummy and point your hand and imagine it as a water hose and let the current flow. That's all the simpler it is. Let Jesus flow. Say amen, somebody. All right, let's go to point two. We grow in his presence. This is talking about spiritually. But we've got to, if you want to grow fast, you want to develop quickly, 
you want to operate in his wisdom, then you got to spend enough time asking God to fix you. You see, I come to God and I spend time with him. I lay my body down as a sacrifice. Then I ask God to start fixing me mentally, spiritually, and physically. Quicken my mind, help me, so I am working with you, O oh Father, and not against you. Father, that you include me with your rescue plan, your redemptive plan, and Lord, you're part, we are part of people touching lives and winning souls. Someone say amen. But God won't use us when we're in the flesh because we might damage somebody or ourselves. So we have to be in the spirit. So we need to grow in the presence of God. So as Pastor Carrie here, my wife also, my job is to try to convince you to spend more time with God. That's my first and foremost. Second, time in his word with God. Now, I know you have schedules, you have businesses. Some of you are working double time and stuff, but you've still got to have that charge time with God. It doesn't work any way else. You're going to break down. And then for God to take the time to repair you, you wasted all that time when you could have avoided it. Say amen. And keep your eyes off yourself because what the devil's trying to do with people in this hour, I'm going to say this by the spirit, is to give you the blues. Oh, poor me. I'm getting older now. Half, more than half your Stop all that. That's a trick. You can't feel sorry for somebody that's dead and passed. And I am crucified with Christ. You see what I mean? It's a, it's a trick of the enemy to get us to self-focus. And we're not going to do that. Say amen. So go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Look at these two verses, 12 and 13. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more as I'm away from you in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I thought we, we're not on a works program. Who are you working your salvation out with? Come on, everyone. Jesus. He says it in the next verse. Verse 13. Look at this. For it is God who works where? In you. See, God's a fire in you, working. The closer you want to present yourself to God, the more you get a little word, the more the fire burns hotter. That means it burns away all the foolishness of your life. Lay aside the weights, the foolishnesses. Work out your own salvation with fear and trouble. For it is God who works in you to do his will and for his good pleasure. So guess what? He's got only good for you. Amen. Go with me to John 15. You know this one. We covered it a couple of times. He says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, see, in the presence of God. You have to abide with God long enough for him to make some adjustments in you. Well, I thought he did it all. Come on now. You're not the prince of denial, are you? There's a lot of stuff you need work on. And that's where a lot of Christians fail in their ministries. Everything keeps changing because they can't settle in and really produce some succulent fruit for Jesus. And it goes on, if anyone does not abide in me, see, this is talking about a believer. You, you're going to either hang around God and learn the God stuff, or you're just going to visit once in a while. He's cast out as a branch. Why? Because he keeps operating in the natural and in the flesh, and in the natural and the flesh has sin in it. Sin cannot please God. So you can't serve God in the natural and in your flesh because your flesh is a putrid to God. So you die to your flesh daily and you live for God in the spirit daily and he's enjoying you because Jesus is in control because you placed him yourself there that day and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and you get to grow and sweeten and next thing people look at you and say, you look different. What is the world's going on with you? 
And you can smile at him and say, it's my relationship with Jesus. I've learned to walk with him. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk with Jesus. Amen? And it says, if anyone does not abide in me, then naturally he's cast out and withered. And they gather them up and make fun of them. Throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. Why? Because it will be God's desire. It won't be your desire. And it will be granted. And you know, sometimes when you ask, that means God has answered it. But it might not show up on your doorstep tomorrow. He's got to get the stubborn cow to bring it to you with that bag of money. And it's lost up here in the side street. You pray those blessings then. Lord, you said you promised me I'm going to get this. These are going to be these blessings. They're all mine. But Lord, if I don't pursue you instead of the blessing, then I'm going to block the blessing. So Lord God, instead, I know they're on their way. Instead, I'm going to enjoy the journey. Folks, Christians are not enjoying their journey with God. You're on a journey every day with God. Enjoy him. And through the hard times, look, you're going to pass right through those. You're in a tank. Start enjoying God. And a lot of times we think we're always in a battle. No, you're always in a battle because you're still alive and you're supposed to be dead. Smile and say, oh, that's it. I'm supposed to be out of the way. Oh, that's it. Ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Remember, we're in the kingdom. God is working on your behalf. Things are being done for you. Wave your hands at me if you see things being done for me. For, absolutely. Don't get your eyes on the world or why it's not here yet. Come on, say amen. Amen. And here is my Father glorified that you bear what? Much fruit. The only way we can is to abide in the vine. Point one, church, we're to grow spiritually only when we get in the presence of God. That's why Satan tries to keep you always in turmoil, always in a challenge, having the wrong mindset. Why? Because we grow in the presence of God. And if you're so busy trying to just get into the presence of God, how can you grow? Another thing is to remember, your flesh doesn't want you to grow. Your flesh has been your buddy for years. It doesn't want to be crucified and doesn't want to shut up and be quiet. Say, oh me. But you have to make it. Because it has something in it you don't want to hang around. That is the willingness to break down and go do something wrong and then come to God, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Aren't you tired of those kind of games? Of course, everyone gets tired of them. That's Satan's trick. Secondly, now God is at work inside of us. So we present ourselves to God daily, first thing, and receive a good charge, a good adjustment in our soul. That's our soul realm. And then the seed of Christ begins to grow and develop more and more and more. Remember, you've got a perfect seed in you. His name is Jesus. And he's developing. For some of you, he's really developing. But don't shut it down because you think you already got a victory. You haven't arrived home in heaven yet. So God's not done with you. Thirdly, there's no time with God, no growth with God. We have a whole bunch of people who, love, who say they love God. Now, I'm not putting anyone down. But you can't tell them between the difference between the world and them. Yet you ask them, do you love Jesus? I love Jesus. And then you ask them, says, well, how come here? You know, you, you can go through anything. They love Jesus, but with their heart, they love Jesus, but they're not serving Jesus. And the second other thing, they're still, still letting the wants and desires of their flesh to lead and drive them. And that we call them, and, and Paul calls them, carnal Christians. To be carnally minded is death. 
That's your old way of thinking, the old negative thinking. You know, I know the pro promises of the Bible tell me I, I have this, but, you know. So you got to wash that out of you. Don't let that hang around. Jesus said, when I come again, will I find anybody believing? Whoa. Amazing. No time with God, no growth spiritually, only natural development and natural applications. That's why you can get somebody who's moving in the spirit and they're as grup as a piece of sandpaper. Hello? Seen him pushing people down in the spirit and doing all that crazy stuff, trying to get the Holy Ghost to work. You cannot move the Holy Ghost in the flesh. The Holy, Holy Spirit's always moving and always has a little place for, to move you around if you're attentive and humble. All right, fourthly, church. We work our salvation out with Jesus. No meeting with Jesus, no being with Jesus, no working out your salvation. So you're going to constantly go through the same patterns of problems over and over again. Everyone say, not me. I'm working with God. Amen. Let's go on to our next point. We are hidden and shielded in Christ. Do you believe that? Do you believe the word of God? The Bible says we're hidden and shielded in Christ. This is New Testament. They didn't have that too much in the Old Testament. Think about the Israelites. They had to obey God to be blessed by God. And when they disobeyed God, what happened? Terrible things. We're in the New Testament. God lives in our heart now. He's provided a means where you and I can live in the kingdom, be his child, operate in the spirit, but we have to go to him so he can get us in tune with that and dial us in. Now, let me tell you, the biggest secret to that is the time you spend with God. Because he's the one that dials you in and tunes you up. We have the want to, but do you have the follow through? And the more time you spend with God, the more like God you'll become. Well, Lord, that means a lot of times we think we're spending time with God, but we're really only in his presence. You need to open up and let him do some real carving away of your insides. Popping out some of that nasty stuff that keeps popping up. And only God can do that in your precious one-on-one -on -one time with him. Say amen. It's all good, folks. It's really good. So let's look at the basic scripture. When I got a hold of this 20 years back, it changed my Christianity. Okay? Colossians again, chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. If then... Remember, we're supposed to have a heavenly mindset. If then you were raised with Christ, we got born again. What do we go after? What do we seek after? Seek those things which are above. In other words, try to keep your eyes off of what's going on in the world. Don't ignore it. For heaven's sake, don't run a red stop sign, you know. But don't focus on it so much that that's the picture you see all the time is a dearth and brokenness instead of hope and faith. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Everyone say amen. amen. Set your mind. Have your mind set. On things above. Set your mind. Where do you set your mind? Right there in that prayer meeting with God. God sends you out in the spirit. Set your mind to keep his vision in front of you. I mean for the day. Not your whole vision. For the day. Victory and glory. Looking for somebody has a sneeze so you can lay hands on them. You're in control, in the control house, under God. You're not driven by circumstances. You control them. 
Why? Because the God of control is in your heart waiting for you to ask him. Who's going to ask? Who's going to go in his name? And he says, look, two, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died. Christians still don't get it. I cannot get in an argument if you died with you. You won't get insulted if, if I tell you, you know, you need to get going on some things. Because why? You're dead. You have no reason to defend yourself. You're in Christ now. God, Jesus is an advocate. He defends you. Your love defends me. You see, so the, the more you try to promote yourself, the harder it'll be. The more you try to promote Jesus, he'll make a way where there was no way. He'll open up doors that no man could close. He'll show you things to come that will tickle your heart. Keep your eyes on things above, not on things of this earth, for you died and your life is now hidden from the devil in Christ in God. That's where you are spiritually. So I, as your pastor, recommend you meet with God so God hides you, he tunes you, he adjusts you, and he fills you, and then he lines out your steps of the day, and you can lift your eyes in praise, knowing no matter whatever comes your way, God's already gotten the victory because you're in the tank. And the weaponry, just think of the weaponry you have. You have smart bombs. They're all computer-driven. You just send them forth in Jesus' name, and God comes out of you like a missile. Father, I bind up that spirit that's trying to cause that person to steal I place them on your altar and claim their salvation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you said I have authority in John 17 of all flesh, so I render his flesh ineffective. He'll get no pleasure out of drinking, drugging, doing any of that. Now bring him to his knees in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Boop, put him on your altar. There goes one. Let's move on to the next. How long did that take me? You have a covenant with the most high God. There isn't any other God. He's looking for us to bring forth his gospel and to share his son. Nobody's not going to know about it until we release his son with power. Can you say amen? Woo. Man, I tell you what. Let's drop down to verse 16 and 17 of Colossians, the third chapter. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It helps your mind think about the positive, keeping it up. Why? I'm talking about mostly the graceful New Testament. Old Testament's good if you keep it in the light of the new. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Wisdom deals with doing the word. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, here we go, doers of the word. Here we, this is great. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, through him, through him. Paul understand, he understood what it meant to be in the tank. He, he wouldn't call it that. He called it armor back then. But in the tank, and we live through him. Don't let the enemy get you to speed up or feel like you're behind in a lot of stuff. No, you just keep in the tank, keep loving God. And if you are a little behind, God will catch you up. But worrying about it is not going to get you there. 
couple of points and we'll move to our last point. Church, we are to dwell in God's presence as much as we can. That's where we grow spiritually from the inside out. We need to learn to walk in his kingdom. We do that by being led by the spirit. For it is God's presence that produces the fruit of Christ in our heart. We bring the seed to God. He waters it. He strengthens it. And that in his presence, we grow up spiritually. Now, we can develop mentally and physically in the natural and going through what we do and experience. But the understanding of and growing spiritually comes in the presence of God. Do you get that? I want you to get that. That's why the enemy tries to keep you out of it a lot. Well, I thought I would just walk, walk around in the presence of God all day. Well, yeah, you kind of do, but you're not aware of it all the time. So in order to kind of break you loose of that, just invite God. Say, so, Lord, we're gonna, I got a couple of business deals, you know it well. I got a couple of things that are going on. I have to go on a journey. Would you come sit next to me in the truck and let's just drive along? C include him in your conversation. Now, I know he's in your heart, not next to you in the truck or in the car. But the idea is to include him. Remember, he's here, really. He's completely, he's in your heart. He's here. He came in Pentecost. He's here. But he's not loud. So involve him in your conversation throughout the day. It's wonderful. And he'll involve you with some wisdom and how to do something, right? It could be something as simple as how to peel an egg. I read it just about everything you can read on how to peel an egg. I make a mess, chips and eggs and everything. And so God said to me, just as clear as a bell, he says, take the egg, hold it in your hand, take a sharp knife, but don't whack your hand with it, and just go, but, and you'll go into the egg, and then you'll be able to split the egg open, take a spoon, round all around, and then you won't have to worry about shell. I thought, wow. Where have I been? I remember one time. Can I tell one more? I, we just got this new microwave some years ago. And the mic, I was used to a microwave with having a handle on it. This microwave looked like it had no handle at all. So we got it. I went to test it out. And I'm reaching up on the top of it, grab the lip, try to pull it open, or underneath the bottom and everything. And I'm going around, and I'm going, man, Lord. Clear as a bell. God says the handle's in the center by the window. So I reached in there. There's the handle. Ah. Why are you saying that, Pastor? It's because sometimes it's just like that. We got a handle on it, don't we, buddies? Come on. And God says, sit. If you did it this way, and boom, you wouldn't be taken all day. That's what God wants to do with all of us. That's who you are. God lives and walks and talks in you. All right, let's go to the last point, command center. Am I talking too much? Don't answer that. Folks, you dwell. If you're in the spirit, you're living in the spirit, walking in the spirit the best you can, meeting with God, doing the things he's asked, because we're supposed to be doers of the word, then you're dwelling in his command center. When you're in command, that means you're in command. So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, the Spirit of God whisks you up into the command center. Now, if you start your day out, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, cleanse me from all unrighteousness, you're whisked right up into the command center. And you know who's there? Almighty God and the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And there you are sitting, not with a bunch of people, you, face to face, in the command center. Now, without a vision of that, without knowing about that, then we're not going to take on the authority that we have in God. Now, can I ask you something? Can the devil get up in the throne of God? Do you know that there are about 50% of the Christians believe he still can? He was thrown out of there. He's not even allowed in the spirit. 
That's why he pesters us so, so we never learn the rhythms of God. We don't learn how to walk in the spirit. We go to the loud and the, the noisy circus type churches, which are wonderfully fun. And boy, they leave, they're excited, and everybody's fired up, but that's emotion. Emotion goes away rather quickly. You need to come resting back down to your relationship with God. I've been to a lot of tent revivals. Gosh, I helped work at Puyallup Four Square. I love that church. It's huge now. I could never go there. It's not as bad or anything. It's, to me, I want some meat. I want to understand a few things. So I'm just not hyped up and then go through another rotten situation. Our job is not supposed to be, as a Christian, a roller coaster. You get on fire, you got everything, and then you take your ease and your back's like, roller coaster. Yow. Remember that one? We have to, we used to have to play that music. Play that funky music, you know. Roller coaster. Ow. I hope my kids are laughing. Either that's his dad. Don't do that again. All right. Are you with me? So we're in the command centers. Now look what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing, in other words, when you see that term, here the author is saying, I want you to understand that we have a great high priest, his name is Jesus, who has passed through the heavens right there alone, lets you know that Jesus has broke through this prison, rose from the dead, and because of that, we could be born again and rise from the dead as well. We are marked for salvation. We are a part of God's rescue plan, and we're supposed to be laborers in the harvest. Say amen. And broke through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. You're a Christian. Don't talk the world. You're a Christian. Don't talk against other Christians. You're a Christian. Listen, don't talk against your country. These only open doors for the enemy to get at you. Pulls you out of the tank and throws you there so he can whack you with a squirt gun. We are our own worst enemy. Make sure you got your mouth in line. Say amen. Keep that confession strong. Say, I got it, Pastor Curry. For we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize how we feel in all these are our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore... Come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So you're in, you come to the command center. Can you imagine how jealous Satan is? When you say, Father, in Jesus' name, you disappear and you're moved up into the heavenly places. That's actually what happens to you. Now, you might be able to still fill the chair where you're sitting, but you're up in the spirit. Come on, let me see the hands of those who've been caught up in the spirit before, and it was marvelous. You can repeat that on a daily basis. And if you haven't, crave it. Ask God for it. I want to be caught up in your spirit. I want to be caught up into the heavenly realms, Lord. I want you to show me things to come. We have not because we... Ah, you're learning. God's just waiting for you to ask, waiting for you to pursue him. And I know you are. But keep after it. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain need. A couple of points and then we're out of here. Number one, our confession should be the gospel. The gospel should be our confession. When Paul was asked, now here you go. Here's Paul the apostle. But before he was a Pharisee. He was a chief of the Pharisees. He was a Judaizer. You know what a Judaizer? Most people don't. That's Jewish people trying to get Christians to convert to Judaism. We're supposed to convert a Jew to Christianity. There's neither Greek nor Jew nor bond nor free male or female, right? So we run out there. One thing about Jewish people, and I love them, is they can argue you shirt right off your back. 
And even when they're wrong, they will not admit it. So you can't argue the gospel with a Jewish person. So Paul warns, he says, get away from them unless you be Judaized, which means that you're so caught up with whether to obey the law or operate in grace, you can't follow God clearly. God wants us to follow God on a clear path. Can you say amen? Not a confused path. And so remember, the cheapest of all Jewish people turn to Christ. So don't let these people run around playing the Jewish thing. They mean well. But don't you get caught up in that because it goes nowhere. It only comes to Christ. We've already received Christ. In the Old Testament, they're looking forward to Christ. In the New Testament, we walk with Christ. Way different. And most Christians are not even taught in that Bible school anymore. My goodness. All right, you ready? Say, would you please hurry up, Pastor Kerr? No, we're pretty good. Point two, the command center is where everything happens. You see, I can take someone who I don't even know. God knows them. And I can place them in the hands of God. And then I can bind all the evil spirits in their life and put them behind the curtain and bind them there having first removed their assignment. So I put John Doe on your altar in your hands, Father. I don't know about this person's life, but I bind his demons behind the curtain. I remove their assignments to destroy his life. Take from him the things that are destroying him. Now I release the angels into his life because every angel is assigned to every human. So there's at least two angels on him. So I release his angels that he is so bound up through sin and now begin to guide him to where he can hear about Jesus being preached and taught. And so, Father, in the command center, I release them now in Jesus' name and I will see them on the other side. You see how much authority you have in the command center. You want to make sure your commands are right, though. Say amen. Remember Peter, James, and John? What were they called? Do you remember that, Linda? They were called the, thun the sons of thunder, weren't they? Do you know why? Because when people started persecuting Jesus, Peter, James, and John looked at each other. Jesus, do you want us to call fire down on them? Remember? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. A warning to us to not take matters into our own hands in vengeance. Rather, release God. And finally, finish point. Remember that you are in the command center. You do not have to get out of the command center to walk through your da daily schedule. You can stay in the command center, working at your job, doing your routines. Just stay in Jesus in command. Say amen. And when a situation arises, maybe you got somebody's called you up, so I've got another job for you. First thing you should do in the command center is put that job, you don't know for sure if it's yours or not, put that job in your docket and plead the blood of Jesus over that and command it not to be touched by the enemy. Second of all, then all the people who are involved, they can't be used the enemy to mess it up, and you call that job right into your bosom. In Jesus' name. You're in the command center. Hello? God says we have not because we... You want that new job for your, your company? Hello? Now you're in the command center. You can pray those things in for your children, for your loved ones. Stay in the command center. Now, folks, let me ask you this one question. Is there any wars in heaven? Is, is God fighting somebody? No. Holy Spirit's down here, and he's not even fighting the devil. He's trying to get our attention. Why? Because he knows if he can get us to walk, talk, and move in the spirit, we'll win souls, touch lives, bear much fruit, and we'll have an honorable life the rest of our life. If you got blessed with that this morning, would you give the Lord a hand clap?